As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Since the inception of organized crime in America, the Italian-American Mafia has always recruited soldiers from street gangs, usually made up of younger up-and-coming gangsters who had a reputation for violence and were known to be able to handle themselves in the streets. We've heard Sammy the Bull Gravano talk about his time with the Rampers, a prominent street gang out of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, which Gravano joined at the age of 13. The gang would commit various crimes throughout the neighborhood, hoping to catch the eye of one of the five families, and ultimately hoping to be recognized and recruited, which is exactly what happened to Sammy LeBull when he was noticed by Shorty Spiro, a member of the Colombo crime family, as well as fellow former Rampers member. Other infamous gangsters who are said to have made a name for themselves through the work they put in for the Rampers were guys like Joe Vitale, who Gravano tells a story about on his podcast about the time he and Vitali were shot at while robbing a car in their early Rampers years. James Emma was another member of the Rampers, along with Gerard Papa, as well as childhood friends of Gravano and Papa's. And according to Gravano, Papa and Emmon were two of the toughest guys in the Rampers crew, but Emma would never get a slot in Cosa Nostra. Instead, Emma would be shot and killed on 79th Street and Utrecht Avenue while washing his car and Papa, who was with Emma at the time, was able to escape. Papa was responsible for murdering Shorty Spiro and Richard Scarcella and burying their bodies in the cement foundation of a building he owned that was being renovated and is even said to have put Scarcella's body under the toilet because of how much he hated him, so every time someone went to the bathroom, they'd be going on his face. Papa was first recruited by the Colombo family, but then switched to the Genovese, similar to how Gravano switched to the Gambinos. But Papa's mob career would be stopped short in 1980, after Vinny the Chin sanctioned a hit on Papa as revenge for him killing Thomas Spiro. Papa was gunned down by a crew of Columbos in the Villa 66 restaurant in Brooklyn. The three Columbos hid in the kitchen until Papa walked in, where they would blow his head into pieces with the sawed-off shotgun blast. Another famous gangster, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, grew up in South Brooklyn around Gravano and Papa, but he was part of a gang called the South Brooklyn Boys, another farm team the Mafia would recruit from. The South Brooklyn Boys were originally made up of a bunch of smaller gangs from around Brooklyn who came together in the 1950s to form one big crew, but the main organization was referred to as South Brooklyn and was located in Red Hook. The South Brooklyn boys were known for their violence, using Molotov cocktails, clubs, knives, and fists while battling it out with other gangs throughout Brooklyn. Casso also learned how to shoot both a pistol and a rifle during his time in training for the big leagues with the South Brooklyn boys. Casso is said to have set up makeshift firing ranges on the roofs of the Brooklyn tenement buildings and would pin targets to the chimneys, making him an excellent shot and was said to be able to hit a soda can with a pistol at 100 feet away. Castle and his crew would also create homemade silencers out of cardboard and cotton to avoid unwanted attention from police, and was also hired by the pigeon owners to shoot down the hawks that would prey on their pigeon flocks that were usually stored in pigeon coops on the roof of their buildings. Castle was arrested in 1958 after a war with an Irish gang and would soon capture the attention of Christopher Christy Tick Fernari who was capo in the Lucchese crime family and member of the 19th Hole crew. Casso was a protege of Fenari and started his mob career as a loan shark, but would soon graduate to drug dealing and gambling and would be arrested for attempted murder in 1961, but was acquitted on the charges after the witness refused to testify. In 1974, when Gaspipe was just 32 years old, he became a made man with the Lucchese's and would be assigned to the crew of Vincent Fisaris who operated his business from 14th Avenue in Brooklyn and 116th Street in Manhattan. Later on, Casso would be assigned to Fenari's 19th Hole crew. These mafia farm teams in New York City, which lasted up until not too many years ago, are said to be allies of the mafia, 
but are still independent from the organization, although there are certain crews that are specifically linked to certain mafia families. The South Brooklyn boys are said to have worked with three different crews who are linked to specific crime families, one being the Tanglewood boys, who directly affiliated to the Lucchese family, located in Yonkers and operating out of the Tanglewood Shopping Center. A crew from Bath Beach, Brooklyn, known as the Bath Avenue Crew, which work hand in hand with the Bonanno family, and a Queens-based crew who operated at an Ozone Park and were overseen by the Gambino crime family, known as the Ozone Park Boys. The Tanglewood Boys mostly consisted of Wise Guys kids and was known for their violent and reckless actions throughout New York City. The Bath Avenue crew was watched over by former Bonanno consigliere Anthony Spiro and consisted of members Pauli Galino, Jimmy Calandra, Tommy Reynolds, Fabrizio De Francisci, Joey Calco, Anthony Gonzalez, and Michael Yamin. The crew was violent and deadly and were known for robbing banks, selling drugs, extorting drug dealers, home invasions, and murders. And the Ozone Park boys were said to be run by Ronald Truckio, aka Ronnie One Arm, who was cop or regime of the crew and were known for their willingness to commit violent and daring crimes, having their hands in just about everything as far as illegal rackets, and was a training camp for a long list of notorious criminals. Carmine Persico, Colombo crime family boss who was serving a life sentence, is said to have also come from the South Brooklyn boys, although it's also said he may have been a part of another mafia farm team known as the Garfield boys. The Avenue U Boys, another mob recruitment gang based out of Brooklyn, were known for committing robberies and assaults, and the Avenue U Boys were once joined by Frank Lino, who would later go on to become a Bonanno capo under Bonanno boss Joseph Messino, who he would later testify against in 2004. Vito Genovese and Carlo Gambino were both recruited from a Brooklyn gang known as the Jackson Gents based out of the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. And according to an anonymous member of the Jackson Gents, the main crews in Williamsburg at the time were the Gambinos and Genovese families. And the way he tells it, there were wise guys everywhere in Brooklyn during the 1950s and 60s. And all the neighborhood kids interacted with them because they were uncles and fathers. And if they weren't related, chances are their friends and neighbors were. And in some cases, they just met them because they were entrenched in certain neighborhoods and their presence was felt. They were driving around in expensive new cars, wearing expensive suits, rocking expensive diamonds and gold. They were respected and feared, and in most cases had a wife and family and a girlfriend or girlfriends on the side. What kid would see that and not want to have a piece of it? The problem is they don't advertise the treachery, the death and betrayal that comes with the life. From being killed by your best friend in order for him to advance, to lifelong friends and partners in crime turning around and cooperating against you with the federal government to help them lock you in a cage for the rest of your life. Exactly what happened to John Gotti when his own underboss, Sammy the Bull, flipped on him. Gotti also came up in a street gang affiliated with the mafia called the Fulton Rockaway Boys after his family moved to Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn from the South Bronx. And after dropping out of high school when he was 16, he became leader of the Fulton Rockaway Boys and would land in jail for his first time because of a fight with the rival gang. While working a job at a Brooklyn coat factory and then later as a truck driver's helper, Gotti continued to commit crimes landing him in jail again after being pulled over in a stolen car and then again for attempted theft. By age 26, Gotti was a professional hijacker and was operating out of the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club in Ozone Park, Queens under the tutelage of Daniel and Carmine Fatico, who were two older members of the Fulton Rockaway Boys and had connections to the Gambino crime family. Gotti would serve a four-year sentence at the Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary for a JFK cargo heist, and after his release, he would become acting captain of the Bergen crew at 31 years old after Carmine Fatico was indicted on loan sharking charges. And despite the fact Gotti was not yet an official member of Cosa Nostra, he was still reporting to Neil Della Croce and even reported directly to the boss of the Gambino family, Carlo Gambino, while Della Croce was in jail. Gotti would go on to be made in 1977 after the books were reopened and after he served time for the murder of James McBratney, who had kidnapped and murdered the nephew of Carlo Gambino. 
Gotti would eventually shoot, rob, and hustle his way to boss of the Gambinos after the famous hit on boss Paul Castellano in 1985. Angelo Ruggiero, one of Gotti's crew members and a childhood friend, was also said to be a member of the Fulton Rockaway Boys. In the 1970s, another deadly gang would come to terrorize New York City, consisting of at least 127 Italian drug dealers operating on Pleasant Ave in Italian Harlem and in the Bronx, and would go on to become prolific members of the Genovese and Lucchese crime families, such as Vincent Bassiano, who became boss of the Bananos, and a powerful Gambino captain, Arnold Zeke Squatteri, who's said to have been John Gotti's connection to the dope game. The Purple Gang was an extension of the original crew known as the 107th Street Mob and consisted of infamous gangsters such as Vito Genovese, Frank Costello, John Armento, and Eugene Giannini, who was gunned down on 109th Street after he attempted to gather evidence against Lucky Luciano for the FBI about his involvement in international heroin trafficking. Dominic Cirillo was also very close to the East Harlem Purple Gang and is known for his position in the Genovese family as being the go-between for the Chicago outfit and the Genovese family. And Carmine Tremonti is said to have been the overseer of the Purple Gang for Cosa Nostra in the 1960s. And in 1983, the Colombo family was said to be running a heroin operation as well as cocaine business in concert with the Purple Gang and Irish gangsters known as the Westies in Hell's Kitchen. The Purple Gang would earn the nickname the Sixth Family in the 1960s because of their reputation for carrying out many murders, similar to the Murder Inc. crew, who were infamous for doing work for all of the five families. The Purple Gang is also said to have formed ties with the Contra in Nicaragua in the 1970s after cocaine became a hot commodity and were trading them military weapons for the powder. According to the article online featuring the anonymous former Jackson Gents affiliate, the older mob guys never told them what they could or couldn't do. They just liked that they were as crazy and wild kids like they were. The only time Cosa Nostra would intervene was if what they were doing impeded on mafia business and disrupted their rackets. But there were certain exceptions to that rule. He also stated there were occasions where certain wise guys will request their help for certain missions. And the Mafia will recruit their members similarly to the way the Major League Baseball scouts scout players from the minor leagues. They get to sit back and watch how individual players perform over time. And the ones they see potential in, they would handpick and continue to train them extensively to make them even more powerful. The men from Cosa Nostra who sponsored the new up-and-comers were held responsible for their actions, so they took their training very serious to avoid them both getting killed, which we all know in actuality is never guaranteed in that life. Whether you break the rules or not, you're still subject at any moment to be whacked down by the person closest to you. And if you aren't killed in that life, your only other options are prison or turning against your friends and family and being forced to hide in shame. As these things become more and more apparent as time reveals and people wake up to the fact that there's only a small chance of legitimate success in organized crime, La Cosa Nostra and things like recruitment gangs tend to fade more and more away. The mafia families that still do exist appear to have cut back on murders to avoid attention from law enforcement, especially after the RICO statue was introduced to prosecute members of organized crime and now members are said to focus more on rackets and business. There will be a follow-up video, a part two of Gangsters in Training, discussing more in-depth details of Mafia farm teams in New York City. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, please like and hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss any new uploads. Click the join button to receive extra perks for a small monthly fee. And you can also help support the channel by clicking the super thanks button or donating to the Wise Guy TV Cash App and Venmo located in the description of this video. All support is greatly appreciated.